the Bible. It's the most widely published, most passionately debated, and most chronically neglected of all books. In Judaism, the Bible records the encounter of the one supreme being with a particular people in the ancient Near East, the Israelites. To Christians, it also reveals that through the life of an otherwise ordinary man born 2,000 years ago, God actually entered into history and began a process that will culminate in the end of evil and the rebirth of the universe. Some of the stories in the Old Testament appear scientifically naive. Others endorse brutality, unless we have reason to believe that figurative or symbolic meanings are intended. The Bible also contains lofty ideals of compassion and self-sacrifice. It leaves us a mix of elements to sort out, but it remains the world's most influential collection of literature. The Bible's own claim to being divine revelation ought not to be taken lightly. I'm Derek Barefoot, and if you doubt there's anything new and exciting to be learned about the Bible, typologetics could change your mind. Typologetics is the study of patterns that reflect, reinforce, and integrate the Bible text in surprising ways. To better understand what I'm talking about, consider some unifying features of popular books and movies. Author Sue Grafton has written crime novels that are tied together by alphabetic references in their titles. A is for Alibi was the first of these books, followed by B is for Burglar, C is for Corpse, and so on. Anyone can tell that these books belong together, that they form a series, but features that unify a body of work are not always so obvious. You probably know that Alfred Hitchcock made a cameo appearance in every movie he directed after he came to Hollywood. But did you discover that for yourself, or did someone tell you about it? Few people would notice these signature appearances unless someone else pointed them out. Let's turn now to the Bible, specifically to the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which comprise the Torah, or Pentateuch. These books contain creation accounts, a history of the forebears of the Israelite people, and a law that was said to have been delivered to the Israelite prophet Moses at Mount Sinai. The law contains a command concerning testimony in serious matters such as capital crimes. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any offense or for any sin that he commits. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three shall the matter be established. Deuteronomy 19.15 It's understandable that under ancient Hebrew law, punishment could not be inflicted when a case came down to nothing more than one person's word against another. Even so, the way the principle is expressed is slightly odd. If two witnesses were enough for a conviction, why not just say so? If it were better to have as many witnesses as possible, three, four, five, or more, why not say that? The statement seems to mean that two witnesses are enough, but three are not too many, reflecting a characteristically Hebrew way of thinking. The law's demand for confirmed testimony has a parallel in science called the criterion of reproducibility. More than one researcher must observe a surprising experimental result before the scientific community will accept it. In the 17th century, Dutch scientist Christian Huygens reported the suspension of water over a bubble of compressed gas generated by an early air pump. The British Royal Society would not accept Huygens' results until the English chemist Robert Boyle and his assistant Robert Hooke were finally able to observe the same phenomenon using their own air pump. In the Bible, the importance of two or three witnesses can be seen not just in the Hebrew writings, the Old Testament, but in the Christian part of the Bible, the New Testament. 
The New Testament begins with a set of four biographies of Jesus, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As described in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a few individuals out of Jesus' inner circle of apostles were allowed privileged access to some of the events in Jesus' ministry. This select group, consisting of Peter, James, and John, were present when Jesus brought back to life a young girl who had just died of an illness. Jesus took along the same three men when he withdrew to a secluded spot to pray just before his arrest in Jerusalem. When we examine this trio, who clearly were chosen to be witnesses on particular occasions, a noticeable characteristic becomes apparent. Two of the three men, James and John, not only were brothers, sons of a man named Zebedee, they also are mentioned together every time we read about them in the four Gospels. The two brothers, along with Peter, besides being chosen as witnesses to certain deeds of Jesus, also happened to be the only disciples to whom Jesus gave alternate names or nicknames as related in Mark's Gospel. And Simon, whom he named Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, whom he named Boanerges, which means the sons of thunder. Mark 3, 16-17. Jesus actually gives the brothers a single nickname, which serves to associate them all the more closely. Peter, James, and John conform to a pattern observable in the way the principle of confirmed testimony, as stated in Deuteronomy, operates in Bible narratives. We might call this pattern the pair plus one, a trio of witnesses in which two are more closely linked with each other than either is with the one remaining. A few years after the death of Jesus, a council of the early church was convened in Jerusalem to decide whether Gentiles, that is, non-Jews, had to adopt Jewish customs in order to be admitted into Christian fellowship. At the council, testimony was offered by three key witnesses, according to the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. These three included the Apostle Peter, whom we have already mentioned, along with two leading evangelists, Paul and Barnabas. Paul, who was also known as Saul of Tarsus, famously had been a persecutor of Christians until he had a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus. In the central portion of Acts, Paul and Barnabas are shown embarking together on missions to the cities of Asia Minor. In the space of just four chapters, their names are mentioned together nine times, and in Acts 15, the two are described as offering their testimony jointly to the council members assembled in Jerusalem. Here again we see the pair plus one pattern, but instead of Peter, James, and John, the trio consists of Peter, Paul, and Barnabas. In future videos, we'll explore some intriguing ways in which the pair plus one pattern figures in the Bible. For now, notice that although the principle of confirmed testimony was first stated in regard to criminal law, it emerges in other situations. Jesus chose three disciples to testify to certain events, but that testimony concerned his role and identity rather than criminal charges. When Jesus referred to the requirement of two or three witnesses, in references we'll look at in a moment, he applied it not just to disputes and disciplinary actions, but to other serious decisions in the church. The Bible as a whole is concerned with spiritual rather than legal testimony. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11, the term prophet is used interchangeably with the word witness. Prophets and apostles faithfully bore witness to God's commands, warnings, encouragements, and purposes. It widens our topic even further. 
to understand that the forms and derivatives of the words for witness in the Bible are not used only of persons. In the Old Testament, a witness could be figuratively a monument associated with a treaty or another object or circumstance that served to recall a historical event. Near the end of the book of Deuteronomy, a song predicting the troubled course of Israel's relationship with God is called a witness. Metaphorically, at least, a testimony or item of evidence qualified for that term. The New Testament books of Acts and Hebrews treat passages from the Old Testament as testimonies in which the writers under inspiration bore witness to divine truths. The realization that passages in the Bible as items of evidence can be, in a sense, witnesses, suggests a fascinating possibility. The principle of confirmed testimony is set forth in the first section of the Bible, the Torah, not just in one passage, but in three, two in the book of Deuteronomy and one in the previous book of Numbers. Look at the wording of the verses in order. The first verse from the book of Numbers says that witnesses, plural, are required for a murder conviction. A single witness is insufficient. It is the following passages that specify two or three. You might have noticed also that the second and third passages occur within close proximity. They are just two chapters apart near the center of Deuteronomy. The verses form the same pair plus one pattern that we've seen in trios of human witnesses in the New Testament. The principle of confirmed testimony in the Torah is homological. That is, the statements of the principle form an example of what they describe. It's possible, though unlikely, that the number and relationship of these passages is coincidental. But there's more to the story. If the foundational section of the Old Testament is the Torah, the corresponding portion of the New Testament is the group of four Gospels. We noted earlier that in the Gospels, Jesus cites the principle we've been talking about. Here are the occurrences. The two sayings in Matthew are just a few verses apart. The first of these concerns the settling of disputes that might arise among disciples. The second assures believers that when they pray unitedly, in effect testifying to God regarding a common need, they will receive divine help. The third reference, which is in John's Gospel, applies the principle to God and Jesus and lacks the specification of two or three. As shown on this graph, the contents and relative positions of the verses conform to the same pattern as do those in the Torah, although in the Gospels the first two verses, rather than the last two, form the pair. What we seem to have discovered is a stylistic device that lies just below the surface of the Bible text. The principle of confirmed testimony as exemplified by the pair plus one pattern. It ties together books as different as Numbers and Deuteronomy in the Old Testament and the Four Gospels and the Book of Acts in the New Testament. Such a device would not be surprising in a book or series of books by a single author. It is unexpected, however, in a collection like the Bible, resulting from a centuries-long process of writing, editing, compiling, and canonizing. Writers at each stage in the process were influenced by those who came before them, but they were not in a position to coordinate with one another to create features that stretch across different documents the way the pair plus one pattern spans Numbers and Deuteronomy, or Matthew and John. In fact, the individual verses we've examined fit naturally within their immediate contexts. They don't appear to be inserted to create a pattern which after all, is so subtle that it's not even mentioned in ancient commentaries. If human design is not responsible, then coincidence has to be considered. The coincidence would have to include the relationships among the various references we've looked at so far. 
It would also have to include the Bible's internal claim to being divinely inspired, since that would explain why features could extend surprisingly across multiple documents. Which do we credit then, accident or inspiration? We're not yet in the best position to judge because all the instances of the pattern are not yet in front of us. As the body of evidence grows larger and more coherent, one explanation will stand out as ever more probable. So please, join me again as we see what typologetics can reveal about the world of the Bible. To learn more, visit us online at our website, typologetics.com, or the Typologetics Facebook page.